Hey guys, I am so excited here. We have an amazing session for you. So donor journeys all begin with one thing, the first gift to your organization. So this is the most important time for you to be able to begin building a strong, mutually beneficial relationship with all your donors. And the easiest, most effective way to do this is by using a new donor welcome series. So um, but when it comes down to sitting and making the communications plan and creating the email content, uh, nonprofit teams often feel very stuck. We tell ourselves that we need to come up with the perfect message, timing, or are worried about our content. Not only won't, will it convert, we'll annoy our new donors, and they'll unsubscribe. Although we know that a new donor welcome series is the right move, we decide it's better to do nothing at all. So I'm very excited to introduce a very special friend uh, and nonprofit digital strategist and technology coach, Maureen Walbioff, um, as she joins us for the Re Responsive Nonprofit Summit to this and guide you through the process of creating a highly effective email welcome series that will help build you strong relationships with all of your new supporters. So without further ado, I'll go ahead and hand it over to Marie. Thank you, Allie. Oh, I'm so psyched to be here this afternoon or this morning, wherever you are in the world watching this content today. I love the Responsive Nonprofit Summit. It's one of my favorite events uh, throughout the nonprofit industry year, right? So we're here, we've got some time to really think strategically and practically and realistically about how you make this stuff happen. How do you start the stewardship of your brand new donors at the right time without risk and without worry? So we're going to jump right in here and let's get going. This is me, the lady with the braid. Uh, my name is Maureen. I am a digital uh, strategist, exclusively work with nonprofits, and I'm a technology coach. I've been working inside and alongside organizations in, for 20 years. My first nonprofit job was in 1991, and I remember when the fax machine showed up. We have well gone beyond that in terms of technology. I live in uh, beautiful Cape Cod, Massachusetts. It's a lovely spring day here, and my mission in life, as it turns out, is to help nonprofit teams make really good decisions about the technology they use and then actually use that stuff that they said they needed when they were picking new systems. So here is uh, my bio and this is me. So let's keep on trucking. New donor welcome series, marketing automation, um, upselling one-time donors to monthly donors, these supporter journeys are all I hear. Uh, four weeks ago, I was lucky to be in Denver for the Nonprofit Technology Conference, and people were talking about two things, artificial intelligence and supporter journeys and marketing automation. And so what I want to start us off with today is whatever tools you're using, whatever email tool, fundraising system, CRM or database you are using, is going to work for what I'm gonna go over this afternoon. So it doesn't matter what you're using, but I want you to keep your supporters in mind. They know they're being tracked. They know, you know when they open an email message and you know when they visit their donation form and don't make a gift. They expect us to use this information to provide kind of a, a high touch personalized experience based on where they are in their supporter journey with you. They don't know how to deepen their involvement. They're counting on us to tell them what we need them to do, when we need them to do it. And otherwise they're kind of gonna sit and be stuck. So it's our job to engage them, tell them what we want to do next. Here's a couple of common supporter journeys. We're going to focus on donors specifically today, but I want you to see how one person, one supporter can be moved in and out of multiple journeys. So this particular person is a donor. So the journey we want to take them on is retention and upselling, second gift, become a monthly supporter if you came in as a one-time donor, lots of things we can do on that journey. 
middle journey advocate. I might take a political action or sign a petition for you. I want to convert that person into doing more uh, things with us, whether it's donor, volunteer, attend an event, whatever it happens to be. And then the green bubble with the down at the bottom of the slide is a volunteer. Sometimes this is how people come into our organization is they, they sign up and they show up, right, physically. Uh, we want to take them on a, on a combo journey. We want to convert them. Maybe we want them to also become a donor. Maybe we want them to volunteer more. Maybe we want them to serve on our board. So when you think about your people, don't just put them in one bucket because they expect us to see the whole 360 of what they're doing, what they like to do, what we've put in front of them that they have not taken advantage of or taken action on. So although this journey that we're going to go through today, this plan is new donor focused, you can use this model these tactics, these best practices, and these examples for any type of supporter that you're trying to get to do more things with you and for you. Every supporter journey has a destination, right? That's a trip. <laughs> it's a journey. Maybe you're on a flight and you've got one connecting flight or hopefully not two connecting flights, but I just wanted to take a minute to help you think strategically here about what you're driving people toward depending on who they are for you right now. If someone is just a social media follower, the first thing you want to do is get their email address, get them to start being contactable outside of Instagram or TikTok or LinkedIn or Facebook or wherever they're interacting with you now. The second stop, you want to learn more about them and you want to tell them more information about your organization, your mission and your work. And then the third stop is actually some type of trackable action, right? Maybe you want them to share information on their social media channels. Maybe you want them to attend an event. Maybe you want them to make a first donation. If somebody's at that email subscriber station, we have tons of those people who are on our email list. They get our stuff. Sometimes they click, sometimes they don't. Our first step is then to expand the number of places that they're connected to our organization. Maybe it's social media. Maybe it's a YouTube channel that you, you're spending a lot of time um, growing videos about your work. Learn and follow. First stop for them. Second stop is a tell and share. I want to give you more information about us. And I want you to share more information about yourself so that I know what about my work interests you the most. Third stop, pretty similar. Attend an event, virtual or real, or make a first donation. Event attendee. Now that we want them to be on our email list, learn a little bit more about us. That same tell, share, second stop third stop, gift, <laughs> or become a monthly donor. If someone is a first time donor, we might want to encourage them to subscribe if they did not opt in during their gift giving online. We definitely want to welcome them to our community of supporters. We've got a little bit of learn more about them, share information about us, and then maybe the ask that the next action we want them to take would be attend an event, become a sustainer, or make a second gift. Sustainers might want to have them become a volunteer. Volunteers might want them to become a donor. So you can sort of see the logic here. You're thinking out into the future. Somebody takes the first action I ask them to take. What's next? The best time to get somebody to take a second action is immediately after they've taken their first. It's a little human behavior, human psychology at play. So we all know this stuff, supporter journeys, new donor welcome series, not new, not new tactics. But as Allie said when she was doing the intro here, we would love to set these things up, but 
I'm not a technical person. It feels too complicated. Our data's a mess. I don't know segmentation. I've never done this before. I don't want to get it wrong. And so we can get stuck here literally four years and not start the new donor welcome series or any of these other supporter journeys. We sort of uh, demand perfection and not progress, right? Here's some common worries that people tell me on the daily about setting up these journeys and welcome series. I don't know what I'm doing. I wasn't formally trained to do this kind of strategic communication stuff. I don't have time for this. Realistic, right? Like I could learn and get some education and know what I'm doing. But if I am over capacity, my team is over capacity, that can also stop us because we think setting something up like this is going to take three months and a thousand hours. Not true. I don't trust our technology. I hear that a lot. There are ways to mitigate that fear, and we'll talk about them a little bit throughout the session today. And then this is my favorite one. I just know something is going to go wrong. I have a vague sense of doom and uh, a worry that some donor is going to call my boss or a board member and go, rah, rah, rah. I got these email messages and they were terrible. I didn't opt into these things, right? That I've never heard of that happening. Never heard of that happening. New donors want to be seen. And so you can do a very light touch for a couple of email messages, just starting to build the relationship as though it were a major donor relationship. This is somebody who's given one gift one time. So I got a lot to learn about them and I need to make sure they learn some things about us. Welcoming our new donors effectively is literally a big key to building a healthy fundraising program. Otherwise, what happens, and this might be happening to you, is we acquire, in one way or another, new donors. And because we don't steward them, they fall right out the bottom after a year, two years. They're no longer engaged with my organization. Maybe they're a bystander on my list and they haven't unsubscribed, but they're not really uh, helping me uh, hit my organizational goals, right? And meet my mission. So if you steward donors when they first come in, they stay longer. And if they stay longer and you add more new donors, your whole fundraising program grows instead of being static, two in, two out. 12 in, 10 out, you know, like we've got to stop people leaving. And the way to do that is by paying close attention to them at the very beginning of our relationship. What is a new donor welcome series? I know I just said it's been around for a long time, but let's get us all onto a level playing field because we all come at this stuff with different experiential knowledge. So a new donor welcome series is a series of email messages that are pre-written, sit down and write them all out at the same time, and they're scheduled in advance to be sent over a few weeks automatically after the first gift was made. When you show appreciation and recognition to your new supporter immediately after they've made their first gift, your retention gets increased. So donors who receive a welcome series, 33% more long-term engagement. That's past two years in my mind. 24 months, long-term engagement. I want to keep them around for two years at the bare minimum. 33%. So you can see the return on the investment of a little bit of brain power and a little bit of time, what that can give you why it might be important to prioritize getting something like this set up and running before end of year, right? That way it's there. And when all your new donors come in November, December, they will be welcomed. So that's a, a great time to get this going. Even though it feels big and heavy and time consuming, you really just need four things <laughs> to be able to pull this off in a way that your new donors are going to appreciate and respond to. 
You need a real person to serve as the message sender. We're going to go through each of these individually. You need effective message content. You already have it, and I'll tell you where to find it. Thoughtful message timing. This is something that gets people hung up is the scheduling. How often should I send these out? What's the spacing between these three or four messages? And then number four, you just need to use the right technology. And there's almost no wrong technology unless you're living in spreadsheets. <laughs> that might be the wrong technology. So let's look at each of these in depth. You need a real human to serve as the message sender. You got to put a face to your organization. You got to use a real photo and a signature in the email messages. And you need to set up a special email address for reply. So let's imagine that your executive director is going to be the sender. Welcome new donors to the organization. You do not want people hitting reply and getting <laughs> messages, <coughs> excuse me, directly to your ED. So you want to set up a little new donors at myorg.org, um, set up some alias so that a, a real, the real person that is named in these messages is not getting a zillion replies. You might want to get those replies sent someplace else where someone can triage them and, and follow up on them. Got a couple of examples here of welcome message one that I think show nicely done uh, adherence to these best practices. So here's one from NCLR, headshot of the sender. I can see who ostensibly wrote this email message, who's welcoming me to the organization. There's a video welcome message in this email. Many of our email tools will let us send a video. At the worst case scenario, you get a little screenshot of the video that's hosted on your website or YouTube or Vimeo. And when I click that in my email, the video will open in, an, in a tab in my browser and start to play. So human centered. Here's another one from Practical Action. Look at how short these are. They're not like really long messages. Margaret scanned signature. Somebody signed a piece of paper, you scanned it, turned it into an image. It's in every one of these email messages. Oh, it's from Margaret. Now, Mar you know Margaret didn't sign that email because <laughs> you can't sign an email. But I think what we forget is how much our eyes and brains look for these little telltale, it's a real person kind of sign. It gives me a different feeling when I'm reading these messages than it does if it's coming from my organization. Second thing we need to pull this off is effective message content. Reuse your best performing content. Go back over the past 12 to 16 months, let's say, Whatever got a lot of clicks, whatever got a lot of donations, whatever got a lot of trackable interaction, shares, whatever, pull it out and repurpose it to sprinkle through this series. We often think we've got to create freshy, fresh content every single time. People don't retain it. <laughs> you know, you could probably dust off a story from two years ago in your end of year uh, appeal series and just tweak it enough and reuse it if it's good and if people liked it and appreciated getting it and took action as a result of it. That's what you pull out here. Use images and short video, video is the way to go, and keep it short and sweet. I know it's their first gift, and I know you have a lot of luscious information about your organization, your work, your impact in the world, that you're like, here, <laughs> shove 20 years of history of my organization and our impact in your inbox. Resist that temptation please. Skimmable, short, and sweet. Think strategically about each of these messages. So this is where we start to get into like what's in each message. 
What's the point of each message? So message number one in our four message new donor welcome series is your autoresponder. It comes to them immediately after they've made their donation. Most of us have those. They're usually canned and very transactional. Here's your receipt, you know, to prove to the IRS that you made this donation. The point of your autoresponder and your confirmation page when someone's made a donation is to give effusive thanks, meaningful thanks. Keep me feeling good about what I just did. It's sent immediately after the gift is made. Go back and look at yours. <laughs> Block out time. I don't know, the week of Memorial Day or something when we're like not a lot of people are around and look at your autoresponders, level them up. You might need some TLC in there. Maybe it doesn't feel very thankful or welcoming. Message number two is the welcome to our community. So you've made the donation, you've gotten the effusive thank you and meaningful recognition. Message two, welcome to our community. You've made a donation. You're now part of, you're on Team My Org. This is where you're going to share a little bit of information about your organization and the impact of your work. The ask might be follow us on social media. And you're going to tell them the type of communication that you'll be sending to them. You're going to let them know what to expect. Message number three. I want to know more about you, brand new donor. I've just told you stuff about us. Now I want to receive. I want to do some active listening. Ask for a bit of personal information. We want to get to know you. You're not just a, an anonymous donor to us. You can ask for things like their birth date, their interest in your work, their cell phone number, Ask if they will opt into text messages, even if that's further down the line for you. So you're going to collect a little bit painless, quick and easy for the new donor to fill out and stare, store this data in your donor database on their record because you're going to use it later. The final message in the series is the call to action. So because we're talking about new donors, the goal is make another gift, another one time gift or become a sustainer. So you're going to ask them to take another action. That's the point of this message. You can ask them to attend an event or register for a webinar, or sign a pledge, petition, become a volunteer or become a member if you've got a program like that. It is not too early to ask for another gift. You will not offend, turn people off. Get them to hate you. And I think we worry about that a lot too. I don't want to come after them too soon after they made a first gift. Statistics for years have shown that if somebody makes a first time gift and then within three-ish weeks you ask them again, they'll give again. Not all of them will, but enough of them will that it's worth asking everyone. Couple more examples. Here we go. Look at that big image, International Rescue Committee. The image reinforces action. The action that is being asked here is thank health workers in Syria. Image shows thanks to health workers in Syria. Quick action ask, right? Thank them. <laughs> Click this button and thank them. There are only two sentences of text in this message. Two sentences. Quick skim. I get what you want me to do. Why? It looks simple and easy. Why don't I take that action? Another example from Hope and Justice. They are smart in their little video up the top there with that gentleman, Ben. They've got a hashtag, their organization's hashtag reinforcing here's how to find me on social media. When you're talking about my work or your support of my work, use this hashtag. This welcome, welcome to the movement email, five sentences of text. And then uh, that big ask button, three things you can do. Boop, clicks you over to a web page that gives more information. I love this example. I think it's these are just great. Another one, St. Baldrick's Foundation. 
it's Mother's Day. This is kind of old, but it's timely since Mother's Day is Sunday. Cute picture, couple words of text, send an e-card. That's the action that St. Baldrick's wants this next person to take. So quick action ask. Whoop, I look at it, I feel a feeling because of the picture. I can do that, I can send an e-card. Three question survey. Now this is not gorgeous, it's from spring 2017, so it's kind of a little long in the tooth here, but this is a new donor survey that's sent out as one of the messages in a new donor welcome series. Tell me a little bit about what you know about us and our work and how you feel about that. Three questions. Boop, boop, boop. Does not pre-exhaust me when I'm looking at it, at it on my phone screen, right? So that's number two. Essential uh, ingredient number three is thoughtful message timing. And as I've mentioned, this is one of the places that people tend to get a little hung up. So my advice, and you can play with this as much as you want, three autoresponder immediately, three more messages over 18 days, three weeks. It's not so much that it's annoying. It's not so fast that people are like, I, I regret everything about giving you my email address and making a donation. Unsubscribe. It's trickling in, in the middle of all the other stuff that they get. If you put your new donors into like your monthly e-newsletter list or things like that, and it's easy enough to do in your system, you can suppress other messages for this audience until the 18 days is up, and then you can push them right into your e-newsletter uh, audience and they'll start to get normal communication from you. When you're thinking about message timing, don't just think about like how often, what days these people are gonna get these emails, but test different days and times. You might wanna set up a new donor welcome series that runs, you do it for three months, 90 days. And let's say your messages always go on a Tuesday at 10 a.m. in your time zone. And you're monitoring performance, open rates, conversion rates, things like that. After the first 90 days, you might say, I wonder what would happen if we sent these on a Saturday afternoon. Let's just change the timing of when these suckers go out and see if that changes your performance. So not only is a new donor welcome series bringing your new supporter closer, getting them to take another action, telling them, telling you things about them, but you can also test message send timing days and times. Um, I saw something recently that says Tuesday mornings right now is actually not a bad time to send things. Your mileage may vary. <laughs> when you're scheduling these out, figuring out, okay, 18 days, they're done. They're out of this series. I use the gift date as day one when I'm timing these things out. So message one, autoresponder, effusive thanks and recognition. We're so glad you're here. We couldn't do it without your support, et cetera. Five days after the gift was made, they get message number two, and that's the welcome to our community. Here's a little bit more about us. Message number three goes out 11 days after the gift was made, and that's the ask for information. Hey, tell us which part of our many things that we do most interests you. Tell us a little bit about your communication preferences. Can we send you text messages? Can we... Uh, follow you on social media. You know, you can get all kinds of data. And then 18 days after the gift was made, message number four is sent and that's the call to action. Make a gift, um, become a volunteer, become a sustainer, and then the welcome series ends and they're out of it. So somebody hops in for 18 days once they've made their first gift and then they're back in your regular communication. Here's a timing example. If my first donation was made on New Year's Eve, 2022, autoresponder, New Year's Eve, 2022, message number one, Ju Ju January, I'm thinking ahead, January 5th, message two, welcome to our community goes out. No, uh, January 11th, 
2023, message three, that survey link or that request for information is sent. And then on January 17th, message four, the call to action, make a second gift, become a monthly donor is sent. And then the series ends. So this just rolls forward. You should not need to know when that first gift was made. The trigger for starting the series is that first gift. That's it. That's all you have to worry about. Here's where people start to get their hair on fire a little bit and, and feel less than equipped, right? The right technology. You need an online donations tool. You need an email marketing tool. I know you got both of them. And you need a survey tool and you probably have that too. If you're using an all-in-one system and there are virtuous is one of them, there's a bunch of them out there. It's super easy because all the data donation is made, that data comes in and then triggers those emails to be sent right from the same system. So that's where uh, a product like Virtuous makes this easier, but it does not have to be hard. It's not as complicated as it feels. So let's break this down, this tech part a little bit more. All you have to do, Update your donation autoresponder, please. Send new donor information to your email system. Maureen made a donation on December 31st. You've got to, in advance, create that new donor survey, right? So it's available for you to send a link to get somebody to fill that out. Make sure survey data is coming back onto the donor record in your database or CRM. And then you just find that good content create those three email messages and set up the appropriate message timing. It, it really is as simple as that. Here's a workflow. I think we're all kind of visual people. So I wanted to walk through like, what, how does this all look? If I was looking down at the workflow for a new donor and the things that need to happen, what might that look like? So let's uh, just decode this for a second. So the green stuff is all about donations, fundraising, the things in purple, email marketing, the red there or coral color is your survey tool. So let's walk through this upper left-hand corner. Mary makes her first gift. Go to the right autoresponder message. Number one is sent immediately. Mary's data enters the fundraising database. There you go. If you go back to Mary makes her first gift and go down, Mary's data enters the email system. Next one over to the right. Message number two is sent. That welcome to our community. Whatever your timing is, message number three is sent with the link to the survey. Mary fills out the survey in message number three. That data goes right onto her record in your CRM. If she doesn't, say la vie. It, nothing changes about this. You just don't have that data to use in the future. Message number four is sent. Make another gift. Become a sustainer. If Mary makes a second donation from that ask in the final message, message number four, the data goes right back onto her record in the CRM. So hopefully this will help you kind of figure out. Sometimes um, I'm a big post-it note person, right? So writing this all out, if you're a physical pen and paper person, using PowerPoint to flow this out, that's what I created this flow chart in. Write out your workflow and make it simple and color code it so everybody knows what system is powering what step and what action. Welcome email rates are welcome. Welcome emails are read 42% more often than in the average email. 42%. I would want to take advantage of that if I were you. So Mary makes her first gift. There is a 42% higher chance that she's going to open your email, your welcome message, than if you just sent a regular monthly e-newsletter to her. So keep that in mind. Again, stats help you carve out a little bit of time sometimes to, to set things like this up. 
I've got a bunch of more examples. And then let's see if we've got time for any Q&A, Allie. So this is, I use this all the time. I love this autoresponder. This is a donation autoresponder for a first gift from UNICEF USA. Welcome to our family and thank you. No, no more text than that. The image is the primary welcome. Look at that kid's face. I, I made that happen with my donation. Oh, I want to do that again, right? So simple is good. Here's an example of message number two. Build on. Again, really short, right? The text explains what to expect. We're going to send you some information about how we change the world through a combination of service and education. Here's the kinds of information you're going to get from us. Five ways to take action. Each one of those li links there is a different thing that the new donor can do. So I have a buffet of ways that I can deepen my relationship right away. And I love this image. It conveys partnership, hard work, and hope. And that is this organization's mission. Hope and justice videos, a get of the views. So if you are not starting to record simple, casual, uh, amateur produced videos on your phone and sharing them with your audience, you are missing an opportunity. So video, if you can do this. Text here is a nice balance of thank you and what to expect. And then those big yellow bubbles down at the bottom, three things you can do. You can tell everyone about us. You can give regularly. That goes to a monthly donation form. Or you can join one of our abolition groups. I can pick what I feel like doing. We all love the animals. They've got the best pictures, right? The best, best images. This is a social media follow ask. This would be in message two. The Im image here illustrates connection, feelings, oh, that cat and that human having a moment. There are only 16 words in this email message. I counted them twice. They're using a hashtag and they include examples of social media posts. Again, letting me know what I can expect when I get communication from you. Here's a, a, an ask message for, right, example. St. Jude's Children's Research Hospital, special audience, volunteer newsletter, just to volunteers. They've got impact statistics here. Last year's donations of over 2 million bucks provided housing and meals for 3,210 families. And they're transparent that it's another ask. This is for volunteers who've made one gift. Will you make another donation? Don't be afraid of that. Test it. Test it with your audience. Don't just do it because St. Jude's is doing it. But, you know, if St. Jude's is doing it, it kind of works. <laughs> Key takeaways here. New donors expect to be welcomed into your organization. Technology allows us to give a one-on-one -on -one experience at scale. People feel like you're writing just to them retention rates go up dramatically when you steward your supporters starting on day one. Don't wait. A couple things for a pep talk here. If you can only send two messages, great. <laughs> if you don't have a survey tool, forget about it. Just use the things that you can do. Think about your success metrics. What are you going to want to measure? Hard to measure email opens these days. So how will you know that this is performing? And it, as I mentioned at the top, you can use this model to welcome and steward other types of supporters. Uh, we got six minutes for Q&A, Allie. Um, I just want to let people know I got a link here if people want a free planning worksheet four, six pages, I forget how much is in there. It will help you document your answers, your content, your sender name, and your timing to kind of plan this out before you start to build it up. So uh, Allie, five minutes on the clock. Do you have questions that have come in?
Let's see. <clears throat> Allie, here you are. I see you pop in on mute. I'm back. Sorry, it took me a second. <laughs> Technology, right? Yes. Okay, so we have a few questions. Let's see. So Natalie said, um, for the 42% um, increase in open rate, what do you think that accounts for? I think people know they just gave you money and they want to see what your response to that act of generosity, that first act of generosity is. That's my what my gut tells me. I don't think anybody's really done a study, Allie, to go back and ask new donors, you know, why did you respond to the welcome messages? But but that's what my experience tells me is probably going on. Yeah, I agree. And then Anne said, can you talk about subject lines for these emails? Yeah, yeah. be clear. Um, some people like emojis and subject lines. Some people don't like them so much. Um, I would test some things. So I think uh, something that is interesting, that is not like a bait and switch, like you say, free money. <laughs> Somebody clicks that email and it's not about free money at all. So I would pick out a sentence in your content and then like three or four words and use that as a subject line. Let's see, we've got, got a good bit of questions here. Okay, let's see. We've got from um, Karen, it says, what about organizations that are primarily direct mail and do not have emails? Do you suggest a snail mail welcome series? Yeah, I've seen that work really well, Karen. You can, and, and I've seen that start with a postcard, like a postcard that on the front of it, it says, you rock. Like that's a real example that I've seen. And then on the back of the postcard is the printed content that you might have in message one. Yeah. That's a great question. Okay, let's see. What about first time gifts made in honor or memorial? Yeah, I think, here's what I think. Keep it simple. So I would absolutely include them. Sometimes I see people exclude uh, new donors who gave to a peer-to-peer -peer campaign, right? They're a little further removed from you than someone who made a direct gift without being asked by a fundraiser um, on your behalf. So what I would do is include them. And as you run this, if you've got the ability to be a little bit more sophisticated after the first six or nine months, then maybe you send a different welcome series to people who've made a tribute and memorial gift, but get your proof of concept going with the general population first. Yeah, that's great. Let's see, we've got, um, could you name a few platforms that would be great for sending automated welcome series? Have you had experience with constant contact for this purpose? Um, I have. So Emma, Constant Contact, MailChimp, Active Campaigns, there's a bazillion of them out there. Um, as long as you can get someone from your fundraising system into your email tool, then it's very easy to create that series and have people just go through it in, in the automagic kind of way that Constant Contact would do. But you got to get that new donor data into your email tool to start it off. Love it. Love it. Do we have any other questions come through for Maureen? Great session, Maureen. Absolutely. So many great takeaways and just always keeping it authentic and real. I love it. Um, let's see. We might have one more question. Yeah, you can do this. I mean, I'm not kidding. This is not just look at these slides and listen to this person, you know, talk about it. It is, it is not as hard as you think it is. You just need to invest a little time. And if you're feeling like you're up to here in regular work, look out, pick a week in July and book off an hour a day to start to plan this thing out. Mm -hmm. It doesn't have to be tomorrow. Right. I love progress over perfection. It hangs um, us all up every single right, time. Right. Um, okay, we have another. We have time for one more for okay. David. He said, "Would you recommend altering the series for high wealth new donors? Would you have? Would you ever recommend substituting a message in the series with a phone call?" Yeah. Right. Oh, sure. Um, and that's a great question. I I've seen some orgs say if you've made it, if the first donation was over a thousand dollars, don't put them in this series. Assign them to a, a gift officer or a prospect manager and do that kind of interpersonal stuff that those folks do so well. 
What a good question to wrap it up on, Allie. I, what a great, all these great questions. Uh, well, thank you so much, Maureen, for spending the time with us. An amazing session. All of these slides, I know we're getting a lot of questions about will these, uh, will the slides be available? Yes, they're going to be all available later today by the end of the summit. Um, so we are so thankful to have you guys. Uh, feel free to join us for our keynote session. Um, and we will uh, with Clay Buck, with Barbara Riley and Lynn Wester. So it's going to be an amazing session on how to become a responsive fundraiser um, and having some cage rattling questions uh, that they're going to ask and get answered for you guys. So thank you so much, uh, everybody. We'll see you soon. Thanks, everybody. Have a great rest of your week. Bye, Bye guys.